I want to say a huge thank you uh, to all of the ministers, to Nicholas, Nathaniel, Shandy, and Kyla for setting the bar so extraordinarily high for Catalyst sermons. Um, yeah, thank them for it. Um, but the one thing I'm reassured by is that the same spirit that led them, um, I ask and I know, is with me here tonight. Um, so tonight I'm going to ask you to open to 1 John 5. Um, we're going to be going over uh, the last chapter of 1 John. And it's on. Cool. Um, and before we get into it, um, I just want to give a little bit of a summary and say what led us here. Uh, this last chapter of 1 John is truly um, a, a concluding chapter. It is a chapter that sort of summarizes the last couple of points, as well as moves on into some new ground, just to reiterate the purpose for which he is writing this letter. Uh, But before we get into that, I'm just going to ask God to be with me and all of you here again today. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you are here with us now. Lord, I pray that you would give me your words to speak, um, that I would be attentive to you, and Lord, that you would be at work within hearts here tonight, um, that as we go forth from this place, we would be able to testify to your name, um, to everyone we meet, Lord, and that your testimony would shine through us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So like I said, um, 1 John 5 is a really good chapter. The first little bit just kind of summarizes the last couple of points that John was making. Um, Those points being, um, if you love me, if you love God, you will love his children. You will love his people. And if you love God, you will obey his commandments. So we're going to go in, we're going to read the first five verses, and we're going to have a little bit of discourse along that. So join me in 1 John 5, verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And so like I said, here John combines and summarizes the last two points in the first couple of verses. He he makes it adamantly clear that Shandy was right in saying um, that in order to love God, that shows itself in us loving his people. And also, in weeks previously, we've talked about how if we truly love God, we will recognize that we will obey his commandments as well. He goes a little bit deeper here, though, however, and he says that not only are we called to obey his commandments, but that his commandments are in themselves not burdensome. Christians don't really like that. We don't really see that as evident because we understand that following God's commandments, keeping his laws and statutes, living for him, is not easy. And I understand that. I admit, for me, too. We always protest that we think we know best for ourselves, and so how can someone so distant and so far away know us better than we know ourselves and tell us what to do? But honestly, that comes from a broken perspective. We have a God who not only knows us completely and com- completely now, but our complete past, and he also knows our complete future. And so if we believe we have the right to attest to our own lives and direct our own lives because we know who we are right now, and that little broken, faded view that we have, how can we not agree that God knows us more, and how can we not obey his commandments? But I'll admit that in order to understand this better, we need to understand what a burden actually is. And so if you're taking notes, a definition of what a burden is, taken from multiple sources, is something that hinders progress or slows our pursuit of a goal. It is a weight that bears upon us as we seek to obtain a goal. And so as Christians, because John is talking to Christians here, what is our goal? Because in order to understand what a burden is, we need to understand what slows us from reaching that goal. And John has continuously clarified it throughout this letter. He says our goal is to love, to praise, to be in a relationship with, and to spend eternity with God and Jesus Christ and with him. And so I ask you, what weighs us down? What slows us in our pursuit of this goal of having a relationship with God for eternity? Is it his commandments or is it sin? To look at it in a different light, are we autonomous in our sin? Are we? Do we have the right to choose whatever we want in the midst of our sin? Believe it or not, what the world tells us is freedom, that ability to choose, 
that ability to choose right from wrong, in the midst of sin, it's not actually freedom. Because without God, without righteousness, without the identity and the spirit within us, we cannot choose the right way. We can't seek him. We can't have a relationship with him. We can't obtain that goal that we have as Christians because we don't have him. We don't have the one spirit that breaks that bondage. And so we are not autonomous in sin. Sin has so engrossed our beings that it has burdened us. That is what slows us down. That is what stops us from obtaining that goal. So as we're walking throughout our lives and stumbling in sin, we recognize that the shame is actually the burden that we're carrying on our back. It's knowing what we want to do and finding ourselves not doing it. It's knowing that we shouldn't do something, but finding ourselves doing it. Paul puts it really clear that way. And so we carry around that burden of sin, and that's what hinders us. So just a little bit of an illustration in order to understand that. So say you're climbing a mountain. You know, you want to get to the, the top, you want to get to the summit, and you have a map. You have a map that tells you exactly which way you want to go. It tells you exactly which path to take. And you come a, across this path, and there's two forks in the road. And you look at the map, and it says, oh, the map says go this way. You look at it, and it's at like a 45-degree incline. And there's some rocks along the path, and way up ahead you see a little bit of a cliff face that you'll have to climb over. But the map's saying go this way. Or there's a path off to the right, which has about a two-degree incline. And you're like, you know, I'm looking at this incline, and the peak's up there, and if it's going up, it's going to get me to the same place, right? It's going to get me to the, to the goal. It's easier, so I take that path. So I'm walking down this path, and the one thing about hiking that irritates me most is when you're on those trails, and suddenly you feel the incline start going in the opposite direction. And you look up, and you're like, oh, I want to go that way, but suddenly you're walking downhill. Everybody's been on a trail if you like hiking. You know what I mean by that. It just feels like you're going backwards. You're going against the goal that you're trying to obtain, and that's the burden of sin. That's what's taking us on. That's what's taken us away from the right path. As we continue to live that life of sin, as we continue to be unrepentant and continue in that sin, we find that not only does it start off at a decline, or start off at an incline and become a decline, but that slope, that gradient, just keeps getting sharper and sharper, and sharper. And at some point, we're going to have to come to the realization, come to the conclusion that we have to turn back because we find ourselves way below where we started off with Christ and where he was telling us to go. And so Christ is the one who comes along beside us and then takes us back to where we were and points us back up the hill, and we have to go through it. But like I said, it's uphill. It's a rocky battle. Obeying his commandments are not easy. But... We also recognize that verse 4 and 5 are clear as well. In it, he says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome our world, or the world, our faith. So it is faith that is that victory that overcomes. Because what comes with faith in Christ? What comes with that is the forgiveness of the sins, the breaking of those shackles, the breaking of those chains, but also the same spirit that resurrected Jesus, that broke death down completely, is the spirit that we have with us today. And so we have that victory. And so the first point for tonight that I meant to say before all of this, but I'm going to reiterate now, is the first point is that we believe. And the things that we believe are, we believe that loving God is loving others. So John says throughout his entire book, we believe that loving God means obeying his commandments. And we believe that as we battle through the Spirit to obey his commandments, they're not actually the burden, but sin is the burden. And so, of all the places where you could have ended the book, I feel like this would be a great place for John. You know, you've just reiterated the fact that we are freed from sin, reiterated the fact that he summarized the two points that he's made in the last three chapters. But um, instead of concluding there, he recognizes that that's not all that his people need to hear. That's not all people need to understand. And he goes on, instead of just the, the we believe part, he goes on to talk about we believe because. We believe because. And he gives us reasons to believe. So join me in reading verse 6 through 12. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. 
For this is the testimony of God that he is born concerning his son. Whoever believes in the son of God has that testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. And this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life, and whoever does not have the son does not have life. So he gives us reasons to believe, but not as you might expect, because John himself was with Jesus. He walked with him. He experienced life with him. And so if you were to defend the legitimacy of Jesus as both God and man, would you not tell the story of how he walked with him? But John has an entire other book about that. Go read it. It's called John. (laughs) Instead of doing that, he recognizes that his audience are already believers. They've already made the profession of faith, which I know many, many people in this room have as well. And he recognizes that We may not have the difficulty believing the events that have occurred, but rather we need something more to reiterate to us both what happened back then as well as what happens to testify and to tell us the truth today. So in the midst of these verses, John says testimony or testifies eight times. So it's rather important. Repetition is a good sign of importance. So I felt like I should just give another definition for you all to write down. So testimony or to testify is to assert the truth of, to bear witness, or to provide proof of. And so, if he just wants to give proof of something, he only needs to give one proof, right? But instead, he gives three. He gives three proofs, the water, the blood, and the spirit. Why does he need three? And in order to illustrate that, imagine you're on the fall float trip, you know? You've survived the summer, whether that be working at internship, working at home, or just surviving your parents throughout those months. Um, And you get back to school, and all those freshmen here, you're no longer the young guy. You're actually the sophomore, you know, the big, strong sophomore who's still a sophomore. But, um, (laughs) and you're on the fall flow trip, and you get paired up with someone you've never met before, a freshman who comes in. Um, And this freshman, you know, you you talk a little bit, you get into the little kayak, you start rowing down the the river, and the only thing that you can really get out of him is that he was born in St. Louis. So you're like, okay, that's something. Um, So you you, you try to bring up conversation, um, it's not really working until uh, you get to a little bit faster area in the river, and you recognize that this guy's like swerving around corners like... Like, he knows what he's doing. And he's whipping around these rapids, and he's whipping around these rocks, and he's helping other people. And so your comment is, wow, you, you, you really know what you're doing. Um, do you have experience with this? And then he gives you the most unexpected answer you could ever hear. And he just keeps going. It starts out down here, and it just gets more and more obnoxious as he goes. And it goes something like this. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. I've had experience in this. I went whitewater rafting down the Zambezi River in Zimbabwe with the mists of Victoria Falls fading in the background. And not only was it rapids, oh no, there wasn't much rain that year, so the rocks were higher. So actually, we faced three Class 5 rapids. Class 5 is the highest you can do without like licensure and permits in, in Africa. And not only did we face these giant rapids, oh, we went completely vertical with me flying out the back into crocodile-infested waters getting caught in whirlpools. And uh, he finishes there, and he's like, oh yeah, and we also had like a three-mile hike out of the ravine to get out of the water, but that's not important. The crocodiles, the whirlpool, and the class five rapids, that's the important part. What's your response? Right. I know you did it. Yeah, I believe you. And so throughout the rest of the kayak trip, you know, you're, you, 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 he started talking, so you get some more conversation going. You get some more conversation going, and um, still, throughout the entire trip, you're just doubting this guy's testimony, and it it rubs off on him. He can see it. So at one point, whips out his phone, start typing in some messages, which is in a river, not a good thing to do, but I needed an object for the illustration, so that's what he does. Um, And by the end of the the flow trip, he, he shows you his phone again, and he has these messages from the mother, the sister, and the brother who were with him on the trip. And it says, uh, river stage was lower, Uh, we did two or three class five rapids, the name of the rapids. Um, Then the sister brushed with an eddy, crocodile situation, hectic climb out of the gorge. Okay, you're starting to like understand that maybe it's not taking this guy at his word. The sister, very different personality, decides to say, ha ha, yes. I think we did stage five rapids, we all got thrown out, I think maybe except mom and Liam. I got stuck in a whirlpool and almost drowned upstream with crocodile right above me, just a few feet away. 
Okay, there's the crocodile too. So you got like two things reiterating the fact. And the brothers, I don't really understand. Um, if you haven't figured out by now, that's my mom, that's my sister, and that's my brother. Um, but the brother says, show him some pictures on Facebook. We fell out a bunch. And so you go onto Facebook, and you get some photos. And some photos as you enter the rapids, as you face the rapids. Yes, that's my face. And as you fall over in the midst of the rapids. And notice, these were taken like moments apart, and there's me already like 20, 20 feet away. And so, not only did he take him at his word, but he took him at the testimony of other people and the testimony of pictures, making it real and making it alive today, something he can witness today. And John does much of the same thing. John takes three aspects of things that promote Christ for being the Son of God, being God himself, as well as being a man here on earth to die for us. And he takes all of these things and he reiterates that fact so that we know, we believe because there is testimony to that truth. And so the first bit that he talks about is the water. Water has various significant significances throughout Scripture, um, but in defense of Christ being both God and man, there are a couple things that scholars really point to directly. The first most obvious one is the only other place in Scripture where you see blood and water used in such close proximity is when Jesus was pierced by the spear upon the cross and blood and water flowed out separately. If anything speaks to Jesus' humanity, it is his death and his shedding of blood. It is his suffering and his death upon a cross in the midst of possibly the most horrible way to die on this earth. But John doesn't just stop there. Water has so much more meaning. You go back a little bit in the timeline of Jesus, way back when, this is his testimony of what happened then, you can think about Jesus' baptism. Jesus' baptism occurred and is a very, very clear instance where the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all there and te testifying to who Jesus is. The Father claims Jesus as his Son in whom he is well pleased. The Spirit descends as a dove, and Jesus is obedient to the Father to be baptized as our example to do the same. And so Jesus and the water testify to who he is. But not only is there a then aspect, there's also a now. Believe it or not, baptism didn't end right then. Baptism still occurs today. Baptism is one of the things that we practice as Christians as a public declaration of our testimony of who Jesus is. And I don't know about you, one of the most reassuring and yeah, reassuring things in the midst of church is to recognize when people have made that life decision and decide to publicly declare that they believe and that they understand that Jesus' sacrifice washed them clean. <clears throat> Just as being dunked under and raised again to new life. That symbolizes and that proclamation of faith, that testimony tells us why we believe. Every person that makes that choice is another person testifying to the truth of Jesus. Then there's the blood. The blood is what he talks about next. There's a lot of stuff about blood in Scripture. Um, we'll go straight to Jesus on the cross again quickly, blood and water flowing out. But not only was that instance when blood was shed, blood was shed in that entire process. Blood was shed because blood, pure, innocent blood, was what was necessary to wash away sin. Throughout the entire Old Testament, the sacrificial law declares that the lamb without blemish must be sacrificed. And this testifies to Jesus being the only one who is capable of doing that. Because there are a couple people on this earth that I would like to say that I would die for in order to save them. But I know that I'm not perfect. I know that I'm carrying around those burdens of sin. And so my sacrifice wasn't enough in order for that sacrifice to be once and for all, for all eternity. But Jesus' was. That blood showed and paid the price that atone, for atonement and what was necessary. But not only is blood spoken about there, blood is spoken about throughout all of Scripture, but also today. Blood is remembered when we partake of communion. Communion is something that we partake as churches and bodies of believers in order to remember, 
to testify and to attest the truth of Jesus' sacrifice upon the cross being necessary and being sufficient for our salvation through belief in him. So there's an element of then being Jesus' own sacrifice upon the cross and the shedding of blood and being genuinely dead. And so his resurrection is all the more clear and powerful in the power of the Spirit because he was indeed dead. And he was then alive. And he is alive today with God up in heaven. But also today we recognize that we can celebrate and we can testify to all of those around us and to ourselves the truth of what Scripture says, that Jesus is the Son of God through communion. And then finally, the Spirit. The Spirit... You know, is an easy one. The Spirit testifies because he says in the passage, the Spirit is the truth. But what is the truth and what does the Spirit actually do? Let's go to the then section. The then section, that same Spirit that performed miracles throughout the entire Old Testament, the same Spirit that enabled Jesus to perform his miracles as he was doing his ministry, that same Spirit that was the Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, broke death, defeated sin, took away all of those burdens that we're carrying around and declared that we are free from those shackles, that spirit testifies. That spirit that came upon the 12 apostles during Pentecost and assures us now that not only do they have the spirit, but every person who believes has the spirit. Every person here who has professed Christ as our savior has that spirit, has the same spirit that defeated death, the same spirit that took upon every single person in existences who's called out to Christ's sin and said, nah. -uh. He said, no, you're not getting in the way. That same spirit, that same spirit who is God himself, that spirit testifies. That same spirit is active today. That same spirit that is so evident every time someone comes to faith. That same spirit that has turned someone away from that darkness and that brokenness of this world, carrying all of those burdens of sin, that same spirit works to turn them to God and invite them into his arms. That same spirit is at work today. And so he clarifies and says that each of these has a then and a now element. Each of these has a God element of him being at work, as well as a human element into where which we can testify ourselves through the practice of baptism, through the practice of communion, and through the practice of relying upon the Holy Spirit and recognizing, as Nathaniel said, when we come into those moments of doubt, we need just look back upon our own lives and see how God has sustained us. Or look upon the lives of others who, in the midst of their weakness, God still produced fruit through them. So there's a human element and a God element. And both of these elements testify to the truth. And so we believe because. We believe because the water and the blood and the spirit all testify. And we recognize the gravity of the situation because he asserts at the end of that passage that Jesus is the only way. If there was another way, we wouldn't be here now. But there's not another way. The only person that could take that sacrifice, the only person that could defeat sin and pay and shed that blood for all of eternity and that be enough to clear away sin was Jesus. So there's no other way. There's no other God. There's no other Jesus. There's no other spirit. And it's only through him that we can have that victory to take off those burdens from sin. And so that second point is we believe because. We believe because the water testifies. We believe because the blood testifies, and we believe because the Spirit testifies. And the third point comes along. Again, John could have easily finished here. He's like, bam, that's why we believe. Do as you will. But he doesn't say, do as you will. He says, let me tell you what follows. He says, we believe this. He says, we believe because this. And then he goes into, because we believe this, we know. And in the last couple of verses, which I'm going to read now, listen out for all of the times he says, you know. So reading 13 through 21. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, there is sin that leads to death. 
I do not say that one should pray for that. For all wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. More on that bit later. (laughs) We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and the eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. So he says the word no seven times in that passage. And I don't know how, long, how they stand up here for half an hour and talk without water. Give me a second. <laughs> okay. So he says the word no seven times. So as I did earlier, let's define what the word no means. At first glance, you think it is just to possess or have knowledge of. But the word in Greek has more than just to have knowledge of. There's an element of having confidence in. To know it is to know it is true. And if it is true, we can have confidence in it. And so John approaches it and says, so what do we know as a result of our belief that is founded upon the testimony of so many? First thing he says is we know we have eternal life. Why is that not talked about more? Why is eternal life not forefront in our minds. We shouldn't gloss over this seriously. When was the last time you thought or talked about eternity with God? We get so caught up in the day-to-day, the fact that we had three tests this week, as well as two assignments and a project due on Saturday and a Catalyst sermon to prepare for, but that was just me. We get so caught up in the day-to-day stuff that we can not even think about tomorrow, let alone eternity, right? But what are we thinking about? What are we geeking out over? What do we find ourselves dwelling upon each and every day? Two things I can truly geek out about. If you want to bring it up to me, I can talk to you for about it for two hours. One, the Lord of the Rings. Love it. Tolkien is a gift from God. Number two, the MCU, Marvel Cinematic Universe. Believe it or not, I read comics before it was cool. Or in in between stage when it was cool and wasn't cool and was cool again. And okay, side note, believe it or not, Random fact, Thanos, the name Thanos, actually comes from the Greek word Thanatos, which means death, you know, snap, everybody, half death, you know, Thanos, snap. You got it? Okay, now wait. I just wasted seven seconds of my sermon talking about Thanos and the MCU when I should be talking about Jesus. I just wasted your time and my time. And yeah, it was a cool fact. But is that our goal? Is that the focus? I'll pose that question to you without an answer. So when was the last time you geeked out for Jesus? When was the last time you geeked out for God? When was the last time you got into a conversation with someone and got so heated in a good way and warmed up and excited and talking about Jesus who saved you? I'm going to call someone out here, and I know someone in this community who I have constantly been reminded to geek about God with, and that is Jake Novak. If you need someone to give you the opportunity to geek out for Jesus, go talk to that man. But why don't all of us do that? Why don't all of us create those opportunities and create those conversations where we're geeking out for Jesus, where we're geeking out for the God that saved us, where we're truly dwelling and focusing upon him in eternity? Because eternity is a pretty long time. Eternity, fellowshipping with the God who loves you enough to care for you, loves you enough to send his son to die for you, that sounds pretty cool to me. And so dwell on on thoughts of eternity. Think about what is most important to you. And when we do dwell upon eternity, we recognize the gravity of the situation too. Because like I said, eternity is a long time. And eternity for us as Christians to be with God is great. Eternity without God doesn't sound so hot. Eternity in hell doesn't sound that great to me. And believe it or not, I believe in a hell where there is genuine punishment for those who disbelieve. Why do we not dwell on that thought too? Why does that not then spur us forward to not only have these conversations dwelling upon Jesus and geeking out for God with our brothers and sisters in Christ, but letting our enthusiasm and our passion show to the non-believer? 
to the one that if we truly love God, we love them too, right? If we truly love God, we'll obey his commandments. Go out and make disciples of all nations. Why do we not geek out for God with others? Why do we not look at eternity, dwell upon it, and recognize the need for action today in light of eternity? So testify and geek out for God. Second point that he brings up here, it says that we know that he hears us when we pray. In those verses, he very specifically assures us that not only does he hear, but he also lends his ear or attentively listens to what we pray. But then there's that little caveat there too that I want to touch on. It says, pray according to his will. Believe it or not, God will not answer prayers contrary to his character. God won't. And so when we pray, we need to pray according to his will. And how do we know God's will? It's not asking for us to know the future. It's not asking for us to know what's going to happen next. He's asking us to pray to him knowing who he is. He's asking us to pray to him knowing what he cherishes and asking us to cherish the same things. Or if not, ask us that he show us how to cherish those things, to love his people and love his commandments and obey them. So not only do we dwell upon thoughts of eternity, but when we pray according to his will, we know he hears. And this scripture also assures us that he responds. It doesn't say we get exactly what we ask for when we pray for an A on a test that we never studied for. God will probably give us opportunities throughout the day to study for that test. Do we use those opportunities? No, we don't. <laughs> Instead, we're, we're dwelling upon thoughts of not eternity, but the MCU and Lord of the Rings. He clarifies it is by his will. And this next couple of verses, which are often confusing, and scholars have a lot of debate over, um, I'm just having that caveat. Um, So I'm going to reread verses 16 and 17, which he uses as an example of how to pray according to his will. Don't forget that. He says, If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life. To those who commit sin that do not lead to death, there is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. So, What is God saying is his main point here? Pray for your brothers and sisters who you see as Christians who are living in a sin and ask God to reunite them with him. Ask God to be active in welcoming them back and giving opportunity for them to recognize the error of their ways. That's his point. Praying for them to return to him. But then he gives this little caveat. And he says that we shouldn't pray for them. Or he says he is not asking for one to pray for one who has sinned the sin leading to death. That's a confusing one, I'll admit you. There are two frames of thought that sort of come to the peak in theologians and a lot of commentaries that I've read. The first one being a very face value interpretation of this passage, saying that though sin leading to death is a sin that has been justly convicted by law to be put to death. Someone who has in our day and age, committed multiple homicide and therefore justly being deserving of death according to the law, some scholars believe that we should not then pray for them to be given physical life in light of the judgment cast upon them. I don't think that that's what he's getting at. I don't think it's that easy because he's talking about life and death and all other instances in this passage as a life and death for eternity with him. So the other explanation, a little bit harder to describe, um, is one who, sorry, we know that any repentant sin will be forgiven. Let's not forget that. We know that Christ will welcome his children, never letting them go for those that cling to him. But remember last week we talked about those who have the spirit of the Antichrist. Remember we talked about those who choose to dwell and walk in the darkness rather than the light. This is what so many scholars would use the term apostasy, to declare. There's, again, a very, very thin line about um, accurate interpretation of this passage, but also it's appealing to, I believe, the sin that is previously in Scripture called blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And that sin is based in those who have believed, those who have known the truth, those who have professed the truth, and yet choose otherwise. They look to eternity, see God, welcome him, 
or see God welcoming them, having believed, having received the Holy Spirit, and they go that way. They know that the trail going up is hard, and they choose to go downhill. They choose to go back down to the bottom of the hill, following that path all the way down. But remember, John's point in this is not primarily to say that there is unforgivable sin, for the only unforgivable is the sin, is the sin that is complete and total rejection of God and his truth, having believed it previously, and is unrepentant. If you have sinned your entire life, and on your deathbed you return to him, he's welcoming you back. Today, I'm sure there are those of us in this room who have been living a life of sin, who have one of those addictions that we're, we're constantly going back to, knowing that it's sin, one of those things that we feel like takes us away from God, and God could never love us because of it. I'm telling you right now, that's not this sin. If you go to God and you pray for him to renew your spirit with him, he's right there. He's welcoming you back. Not only is he welcoming you back, he's taking those burdens off of your shoulders. He's giving you the map again and saying, that's the way to the hill, and while we're at it, I'll carry you up it. So remember that this passage is not primarily talking about that one sin. He's just saying that we need to pray according to God's will. And John himself here doesn't say, don't pray. He says, I'm not telling you to, because we don't know the hearts of people. He doesn't know the hearts of people. Only God does. So he leaves that up to the audience. But remember that this, I already said that. So pray, pray fervently, pray for others. Pray for people to be reunited with him. So the third point has multiple parts, and I need to hurry up because it's taking too long. Um, the third point is, he has not left us alone to face the sin of this world. He hasn't left us alone. He's given us that spirit. He's given us the same spirit that attested originally to our hearts to turn to him, the same spirit that resurrected Jesus, the same spirit that defeated sin in its entirety, the same spirit who when Jesus, or when Oh, that was close. When Satan comes up and says, hey, I want this one, the same spirit says, there is no way on earth or in heaven that he's yours because I got him. We have the truth. We have the truth that the spirit, we have the truth that is the spirit that overcame death itself. And that testimony is that victory because the victory is the truth and that truth is within us. And so our response from that, in light of sin, flee from it. Flee from sin. It says it throughout scripture. What does that look like? It says, if you know you're tempted by something, don't walk towards it. Take it away. And a little bit of conviction tonight. I know that there are a lot of people in here um, who are tempted by things seen in media, in movies, in TV shows. And it's so often for all of us to be talking about, you know, it got a 9.8 on IMDb, therefore it's great to watch. Double check. Don't run towards the temptation when you can flee from it. So not only are we called to flee from sin, sometimes we stumble. Sometimes we didn't see it coming. Sometimes the devil is hard at work in our lives and throwing things at us. In that case, when we can't avoid it, fight it. When we can't avoid it, fight it. Fight it with the spirit who already won. So how can you not win again? The spirit who has never weakened. God is eternal. God is unchanging. So that power, when he raised Jesus, is not diminished. That power is within you. And thirdly, not only do we flee from sin and fight sin, revel in the victory that you have from sin. Rejoice when you overcome that temptation. Praise God when that happens. Don't leave it lying around. Don't just live on to the next day and wait for it to happen again, but truly look to eternity and be thankful to God for it. And so trust God and act accordingly. Flee from sin, fight sin, and revel in the victory. For that same spirit that attested to the Icarus Jesus that Shandy spoke about last week, the Jesus that was incarnate, crucified, resurrected, ascended, and is seated with God in heaven, that same spirit is with us. And he already won. So live as though you've already had victory. So remember, in conclusion, you have eternity waiting. Prepare for it. Think about it. Dwell upon it. Talk about it. Geek out in the midst of eternity. Talk to others about eternity. Talk to your brother in Christ about eternity. Encourage them. Talk to the non-believer about eternity. Be that bit of conviction in their lives, in love, that turns them towards him. Be that instrument that God uses for fruit. 
Not only that, but you have a God who loves you enough to listen to you. And he is attentive and responsive to your requests according to his character. Remember that God does not answer prayers contrary to his character. But we have a loving God. We have a God who loved us so much. We have a God who is righteous and loves justice. So pray, pray to him. And remember, you aren't helpless against sin. That addiction that persists, that wound which keeps bleeding, that temptation you keep turning to, those moments when you face new trials, know that you have the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead, destroyed death itself, and sin in its entirety, and that spirit is within you. But not only that, remember that all of these things hinge upon your victory, the victory found in faith. If you don't have faith tonight, I ask you to ask yourself why. Why don't you have faith tonight? That victory is found only in faith, and that faith is in Jesus. That Jesus which is testified to by the water, the blood, and the spirit, by the testimony of believers ages and millennia ago, by the testimony of believers here, now, and today. And that faith is in one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God, the Son who died for us, the Son who rose again, and the Son who waits for us in heaven as he comes down, returning to us in glory. And so he concludes by saying, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Now, where did that thought come from? Little children, keep yourselves from idols. You may at first ask yourself, why does he change subject here? Why does he then call us little children? There are a couple other instances throughout the book of 1 John where he references believers as little children. In all of these instances, he is clarifying a point. And his clarifying point is saying, keep yourselves from idols. And so he's saying, why have other gods? Why settle for less? Why have a God on this earth in broken relationships when you have one whose very character assures you that he cares? assures you that that relationship will never be broken? Why have a God that doesn't give you more than a moment of pleasure on this earth when you have a God that offers you eternity with him? Why have a God on this earth when we have been freed from this earth's chains and can live with a father who truly gives freedom? Why have an idol? That's how John finishes his letter, reminding us that it is Jesus whom we believe, Jesus whom we trust, And it is Jesus whom is the only one deserving of our praise. So, if you love me, if you love God, you will trust his testimony. And in trusting his testimony, we too will testify. So trust in God's testimony and testify yourself. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this evening. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for... Lord, sending your spirit to guide John to teach these things to us, that we can remember who you are, that we can believe who you are, and Lord, know in the midst of that belief that we have eternity with you, that you hear us even now as we lift our hearts to you, and Lord, that in the midst of this brokenness and sin of this world, we have victory. And I pray as we go forward, we remember these things and dwell upon thoughts of eternity. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.